Hello! This week on Applied Science, I'm going to answer your questions that you submitted last time. So as it turns out, about 1 in 10 of those questions was about zinc oxide, which was the topic in the last video. So let's take a look what happens if we heat up zinc oxide in a vacuum. Okay, here's the setup. I've got some zinc oxide loaded into this metal strip here, and when I increase the power going through the metal strip, it will start to glow red, and we can see the color change in the zinc oxide like we saw in the previous video. As we can see, the zinc oxide goes back to its white color rather quickly in air. Okay, I've now pumped out as much air as I can from the chamber, and I'm going to raise the temperature just like I did before, and we'll see if the color change stays. Heating the sample in vacuum is much more difficult because the powder is a good insulator, and so the heating has to be much more gradual, and even then the top of the sample always radiates away more heat than it seems you can get into it because the, the bottom bit of the powder is blocking the heat from that metal strip. So as it turns out, the zinc oxide does seem to change back to its white form even in a high vacuum. I'm guessing what's happening here is there's enough oxygen that's stuck to the surface of the powder uh, such that it's able to sort of convert back to the white form even under that high vacuum condition. Uh, if I were going to investigate this further, I'd leave it under heat and vacuum for a long time to make sure as much oxygen had been removed from the powder and the powder's surface as possible. One of the most common questions I got was why I make YouTube videos, and there's actually quite a few reasons. Uh, one is it serves as sort of a uh, personal project log, sort of a diary, just so I can look back and see what are the things that I've been working on. Uh, it also serves as sort of a public project log or a resume, and in fact getting the job at Valve and Google X um, depended a fair bit on showing people what sort of projects I like to do and what my skill set is. Later on, when I was doing recruiting, I found it extremely valuable to find candidates that actually had a, a public body of work. So with two candidates that otherwise would be equal in qualifications, if one had a portfolio with 10 awesome projects in it, it was pretty clear which, uh, which person was going to be a better bet. I also enjoy getting comments. I really do read all the comments that I get on these videos, and so making these videos and showing my projects is a way to get feedback from people, from, from you guys, really. Also, the YouTube channel functions as a great motivator, so knowing that I have to come up with a video at least now and then, or hopefully every week, uh, is a great way to get myself in gear. And finally, on top of all that, I actually get paid, and so YouTube gives me a share of the click revenue, the ad revenue that's generated from the ads that you're seeing next to this video right now. And uh, you can go to www.socialblade.com if you're curious about what YouTube channels generally make. One out of three questions that I received had to do with my background and uh, occupation. So I guess I'll start at the beginning. Probably my dad is the biggest influence on me getting into tech, electronics, and mechanics. And growing up, his shop looked a lot like mine with, you know, lots of tools and uh, raw materials and broken electronics and things. So that uh, basically feels like the normal state of things for me. We both really hate mornings, but managed to get up at 6 a.m. once a month to go to the radio flea market, which used to be held at uh, Foothill College. And it's still going on at De Anza now, and uh, I learned to become a pretty good connoisseur of electronic surplus. In high school, I was planning to get a degree in computer science, but realized that I liked working with my hands quite a bit more than writing code. I'm just better at it. And so uh, I uh, started at Cal Poly as a mechanical engineering major and then transferred to UC Santa Barbara. While still in school, I started a business making MRI-compatible computer peripherals. So if you're a brain researcher, you want to put someone in an MRI scanner and scan their brain while they're interacting with a computer program. So for example, if you wanted to study how the brain does math equations, you'd actually have to have the person doing math equations while they're in the scanner. So that would involve a computer display and some kind of a keyboard or input device that can be put inside an MRI scanner. So that involved some amount of electrical engineering to make sure the electronics would work inside the scanner, and also mechanical engineering. Uh, you can't use any ferromagnetic parts inside the scanner, so a lot of plastic machining and that sort of stuff. After graduating, I continued the business for about seven or eight years, and then started at Valve, and then uh, in this year, in April, started at Google X. While at Valve, I worked mostly on virtual reality hardware, 
And I can't talk about exactly what I'm doing at Google X, but I'm part of a rapid evaluation group. So our job is to figure out what the next thing the bigger team should be investigating is. Also, you can check out my LinkedIn profile for more details about all this stuff. The next question is, what is the most dangerous project I've ever done? Uh, there is a video about this. I uh, made aerogel in my shop a couple times, and the second time I used supercritical methanol to do the drying procedure. So typically the aerogel is taken out of its um, you know, hydrogel bath, out of the liquid bath, and then dried supercritically in, in CO2. But you can also do it in methanol, it's just that supercritical methanol is kind of a hazard. So I decided to try it anyway, and so I had, in this vise right here actually, I had a pipe full of methanol that I was heating up with a blowtorch until it got up to supercritical temperatures, which was, I think, four or 500 degrees F, pretty hot. And when I took it all apart, I realized that the aluminum fittings that, it, or the aluminum sort of structure that I had inside the chamber was almost completely dissolved by the supercritical methanol. So I think the chance that the whole thing could have exploded was actually, you know, non-zero at least. And at that range, I mean, safety glasses would not really have helped in the slightest. It, just, it would have been all over. So I, I knew I was not going to do that experiment more than once, even if it was successful. Uh, somebody asked about a shop tour. There is a video of that as well. Search my videos for tour. It's a couple years old or a year old, but um, most of the tools out here haven't changed that much since then. Do I have a favorite project? Yeah, I would say the scanning electron microscope is definitely my favorite project. You can search the videos for that, of course. Um, that project, I think, got my viewership from, you know, 100 people up to the first five or 10,000 or something like that uh, in short order. And I don't think I was really considering myself part of the sort of hardware community until doing that project. Another question that came up a few times was, how do I afford all this stuff out here? Um, I don't drive expensive cars or take extravagant vacations, and so most of my discretionary spending is, you know, on lab surplus and stuff, tools for the shop. Uh, it ends up not being that big of a, a budget problem. Another funny question is, have I ever gotten in trouble for any of the projects that I've done out here? Um, sort of. I, you'll notice that I haven't made any x-ray videos uh, since the x-ray CT scanner, which was uh, quite a while ago. As it turns out, somebody did in fact see that video and reported me to someone, someone in the California government, and the complaint worked its way all the way through the gears of government until it got to a physicist's desk at the uh, State Radiological Health Board. A uh, very friendly person, we had a phone call and we talked about various things. Um, he was a little concerned that there wasn't any shielding on my x-ray setup for the CT scanner, and I agreed that you know adding some shielding would probably be a good idea. Um, but nicely enough, he offered to come down to the shop and uh, certify my enclosure once I build it, and then I'll have a certified x-ray machine. So after I do that, I'll, I'll probably get back into the x-ray stuff. Another bunch of questions revolved around uh, degree and choice of classes and education and college and all that stuff. And I had an interesting experience at Cal Poly that kind of sums that one up. There was a couple of recent grads that had been in industry for a couple of years and came back to answer questions uh, from all of us undergrads about what we should be doing. And so the most popular question, of course, was, well, what classes should I be taking? What should I be you know, focusing on to become um, a useful employee after I graduate? And you know, invariably, the, the, the people who had been in industry said, well, you, know, you should really work on communication and management of time and working with a group well and thinking about how your work interfaces with other people. And, you know, the students would just give blank stares back, like, well, what about, you know, ME 114? And what about ME 104? I mean, fluids? Like, you know, is that a good thing? Should I be worrying about lab work? And anyone who's been in the job market for a while thinks about it and says, well, yeah, I guess that stuff's okay. But really, it's the soft skills that end up being the stuff that you use on a daily basis. Um, it's sort of assumed that your technical chops will be pretty good. And then the thing that really makes it you know, a good situation is, is all of these people skills that make it your, your work actually useful. It doesn't matter how great you are, if you can't work with other people, it's, it's going to be very limiting. For me personally, college didn't turn out to be all that useful, although I still think people should go, unfortunately, because you basically have to have a bachelor's degree at minimum to be considered for a lot of positions. It's an unfortunate consequence of degree inflation. Um, but I am quite critical of how people are educated in the university system and one of the you know, things I'd like to do in my career is either 
compete with universities or try to help them, and it's a little unclear which path is better at this point. Someone asked what happened to my race car. It's still parked in the driveway just outside, so my team will be racing tentatively in Sonoma, uh, I think on January 18th or 19th or something at Lemons. Someone asked what I think about 3D printing. Uh, it's super, super useful for prototyping. Like pretty much every prototype shop should have a 3D printer just because you can have a plastic part in you know, a couple of hours or less that, you know, on, for, with no effort. I mean, you don't have to go to a machine shop or anything. For home users, I'd say their utility is really limited. Um, the local Home Depot even has 3D printers for sale now, and I'm not really sure that's a great thing to do just because uh, we're so early in 3D printing's uh, you know, development cycle. Uh, right now, consumers will probably be pretty frustrated with what they can get out of a 3D printer. Someone asked what sort of new tools I'd like to get for my shop. I wouldn't mind having a laser cutter. I think I would actually opt for that before a 3D printer. Um, I really would like to have a water jet cutter too, but that's just too big and expensive. So I think you know the laser cutter might be a fairly good compromise. A lot of these questions were very specific and technical, and so I don't think I want to do a whole video just for those. I think I will answer them in the comments section though. So I'll try to get to as many as possible that had fairly concise answers and just answer them in the comments. Okay, see you next time. Bye.